Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Card Talk Slab Stocks Market Report. Um, this month, we have a very special national edition. I'm joined here by Aaron and one of my favorite people in all of cards and maybe the world, Nate. Um, say hello to everyone. Don't Let's hype go. that guy up. Uh, thanks for having me. I wasn't here last time, but uh, I'm pleased to be here this time. I'm much, I'd much. i much rather you here than Aaron, if I'm being honest. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I might just leave right now. Honestly, I can just walk, <laughs> walk up the stairs. That's what we like to hear. <laughs> um boys how we feeling post national i know we're gonna get into it a lot but i just want to talk about it a couple minutes here and then we're gonna jump into the report i'm feeling great honestly there's so much energy at that show the amount of people that swung through i read on uh from the nationals website like ninety thousand plus which is the most attendance since one of the shows in the 1990s which is crazy, crazy to see because i literally did not think that you know if it surpassed my expectations i knew it was gonna be a good show but not like chicago last year just based off of you know how much it costs to go places and it being in atlantic city but it's crazy attendance <laughs> Nate, uh, the the vibe inside the conference center was incredible. I mean, there was a buzz in the air the entire time we were there. Uh, it was packed. Anytime I tried to leave the booth, it was hard to get anywhere, which was really cool to see. Um, same same thing happened in Chicago last year, but honestly, I, I wasn't expecting that big of a turnout. And the fact that everyone showed up, even to a place like Atlantic City, cards are alive. That's a shot at Atlantic City and New Jersey as a whole. Atlantic City definitely has some some things they can improve on. Hopefully they will. Um, but I do think, you know, people in cards, it felt like, thought that this national was going to be a lot slower or less attended because of, you know, whatever reason there is. I kind of feel like the national is Disney World. I think I've said that a few times now, but... If you're into cards, like the national is a place that people talk about as like the promised land, basically, of like you need to come see this if you can. Right. So when you're in an area like New York City, where there are a lot of people who are into cards, New York City, Philadelphia, that whole general area, the tri state, um, I think you're going to draw a lot of people down there. So I was really happy to see it. And I was glad to see. I know we have some quotes in there as well about how many new people it seemed like were there, but it did seem like it was a lot of first time attendees for the most part. That's who I talk to, people who are there for the first time. I had a lot of people say this was their first show ever, Yeah, <laughs> which, is, which is cool to see. Very cool to see. Kind of setting the bar pretty high for yourself, your first show at the National. You know I know. I mean, I, mean, I would they're not even pull- imagine walking like, into the National. And- yeah, they're not pulling up. They're not pulling up to, you know, their local like high school gym for a show and getting the same feel. That was uh, me back in 2016, I believe. You took That's me to right. the National. And that was my first card show ever. And we walked in. And I mean, it wasn't 90,000 people, but it was still insane. Crazy. That is great. Your first show was the 2016 National. Where was that? Chicago. Chicago. It was in Chicago. Okay. I forgot about that. <laughs> like that, think, that was your first show. Do you think they're going to add new cities soon? I feel like they should, right? Uh, there. So I can confirm as being oh. a dealer, we got. Well, I don't know the location, but we got a voting list. Uh, three different options for the next three years. Two of them were going to be Chicago, no matter what, mm-hmm. and then it's either going to be Atlantic City in 2024, Chicago in 2024. So it'd be three straight years of Chicago or. Cleveland in Chicago or Cleveland for 2024. And uh, I voted for Cleveland. I've been there before for the national. It's actually the best conference center. I think that Atlantic City was actually pretty nice, uh, but it's also really, really close to the airport. It's probably the easiest one to actually get to along with Chicago. It's closer than the Chicago airport. Chicago airport's like around the block from the convention. Oh, it's like, it's also around the block, but oh, wow. it's yeah. No, I mean, the, but there is a massive parking lot there. So like you can just drive up and park too. Hmm. Yeah, I think they should do the national in like different cities. I know people are like, they should do it in Miami. They should do it in Vegas. They should do it in LA. I think they should do it in like Lincoln, Nebraska. And I'm not even joking. Like, I think it should be like in the most random, like big cities in those type of states around the country. I think that would just be more fun for everyone personally. Yeah, I'm sure logistically it's hard to lock all that down. I'm but... sure. But anyway, <laughs> all right, let's get into the report. All right, we're back. We had some technical difficulties. Um, we are now getting gonna, gonna get into the actual report. Uh, just like last month, I think there's a lot of interesting insights in here. You know, Aaron and his team worked super, super hard on this, so I'm um, excited to go through it. We're not gonna go through every single piece. I think last month went a little longer than we wanted to, so uh, Aaron kind of has some main pieces he wants to go through here. Uh, we will react. I will ask questions. I have questions for Nathan about baseball and baseball cards he has questions for me about formula one racing you may have heard of it so we'll get right into it aaron take it away sir definitely so in this report we have six takes this month i'll just go over the six takes quick for anyone that wants to read this on 137 pm.com i really urge you to it's full of information uh take number one is your voices from the national it's about what is the state of the trading card market from the actual people that attended there 
um, not necessarily us. It's about other people and it's got a video to go with it, but highly recommend checking it out. We'll cover two of the quotes here in a second. Uh, number two is about the monthly market comparisons. We're going to look at this each month. So looking at how the, you know, sports cards in a general sense are reacting to the different markets in the world. Uh, take three is going to have to do with the world cup and baseball right now. There's some momentum, uh, with both for different reasons. And then take number four is on the mod modern and ultra modern cards leveling up with each other. Um, both kind of stabilizing, not as big a drops as June. And then take five is who's hot, who's not. It's about the winners and losers in the market. Uh, player wise this month or this past month in July. And then take six is about the Fanatics effect. Um, it's an exclusive interview with Josh Luber that we urge you to read about and watch as well. And then at the very end, we'll give a final take on the market going forward. But to jump right into it, Lou, I know you're right there. We got some quotes here from the National. Uh, the first one is going to be from Ryan Bannister. RBI Crew 7 owns a shop down in Missouri. It says, quote, the hobby is not dead. The first thing that sticks out is the hobby is alive and well. And Nate, I think you hit on that right away in our intro. I, I think I did. I mean, I 100% agree. The people that were coming up were pumped to be there. They were excited to be buying cards. They were excited to be selling cards. <laughs> a lot of them anyways. And uh, I don't know. It's just It was impressive to see. It was impressive to see. I agree. Uh, Lou, give me, do me a favor and jump down to this one from Joy here quick. This was actually a really good com uh, comment and quote. Yes, and Joy. I agree with this wholeheartedly. Yeah, this is really good. Quote, I've, this is from Joy from Jerner Sports Cards in Dayton, Ohio. I felt like in years past, everyone was chasing the same big names. Imagine going to the show and everyone's buying Luca or KD or whatever you have it. Uh, but this year, I had so many people come and they're looking for their players. And I think the collector market is really strong. Lou, touch on this because I know you made a big splash for a collecting play yeah i think you know in a world where the market has <clears throat> dipped quote unquote right um i think people are getting back to the roots of collecting and what it's really about and for myself i was someone who was like never a big pc person it just wasn't something that was a priority in my mind but i've now finally come across people who i want to collect such as elijah moore um and so i was on the hunt for his I was doing a rainbow. I've kind of decided to give up on the rainbow right at this exact moment in time, but I did get the one of one um, down in, uh, down in AC at the national uh, one of one autograph. Someone hit me up down there, managed to make a deal there, brought it home with me. I was going to grade it at the show, but I was, I knew I was going to jets camp uh, this past Monday and I want to try to get a picture with Eli. And that's exactly what I did. Um, so I was really excited about that. It was a funny story. You know, we get there we're walking around after practice. I see Elijah, like all the players are coming over to where we were and I wasn't seeing Elijah more. And I kind of had a small moment of sadness because I was like, if I don't get this picture, what was the point of me buying this card was literally like what was going on in my brain. Um, <clears throat> so I'm now walking around. I finally see him. There's a whole bunch of kids. And, you know, as people who collect, I think, where, where do you guys stand on like the adults with the autographs? Like we've all seen those videos. They're really cringy. They're super tough to watch. Cause it's like collecting is it's really for kids, not, not for kids, but it's like a kid's focus thing, collecting autographs, all that stuff primarily focuses on kids. So when I'm there standing as a 28 year old man around a bunch of like 10 and 11, 12 year olds, as they're asking for Elijah Moore's autograph and picture, it's like, all right, well, I'm going to let every single one of them go before I even consider asking. So I kind of stood there and waited for like five, 10 minutes. Uh, and he eventually was nice enough to take a picture. I tried to explain to him, like I tried to do like a quick 30 second explanation. Like, Hey, this is your rookie card. This is like the one of one he totally didn't. I don't think he got it necessarily, nor did I really expect him to, but he was nice enough to take a cool picture, cool face. When he took the picture, I was really pumped about it. So yeah, I think personal collecting has become a much more, uh, priority for a lot of people in cards, myself included. Quick comment on the like uh, older people going for autographs. This is my opinion, which is kind of similar to what you just said. Um, if it's someone that's older and trying to shove kids out of the way to get an autograph to go sell on eBay, that is like app one of the worst things I think you could watch. Yeah. Um, to totally backwards. Um, if it's like what you said, like oh, you know, you wait around, let all the kids get their pictures and autographs, and then you happen to have a baseball, and you're like, oh, this would be cool to you know put on my shelf or you know some memory with my kid, this or that, whatever it is, like you know, fine by me. Yeah, totally. It's it's an interesting line to walk where it is what I love. Like I love the cards and I love sports and all that. So it's fun for, for those moments. But I definitely found myself standing in that line like, I don't know if I should be here. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway. Lou, I agree with you. I've I mean, I had those exact same feelings going down to spring training, like 
eight years ago when I wasn't in my upper 20s. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of awkward. Yeah, and I also have memories of being a kid, getting pushed to the side by an adult and being like, this is the weirdest thing I've ever been a part of in my life. So, you know, now it's like a reversal. But anyway. I got you. All right, we'll run off hey, this. Uh, real, real quick, ahead, can Nate. I make a comment on that? On, yeah, uh, yeah. The joy. Um, yes. So they not only just personal, like, collection of players they like, but the most questions we got, the entire national on cards in our booth, outside of F1, because we just had a, a bajillion of them, Mm -hmm. um was about star wars was about charlie day was about uh Fortnite and stuff like that like people came up and especially the star wars cards they were super interested in them they didn't buy them but they were super interested in them and like guys like juan soto julio rodriguez otani they might as well not even existed people didn't care I do have to say, Nate, we also had some pretty expensive Star Wars cards in the booth, but we did have other cards, you know, small Stranger Things relic of Jonathan Byers that sold, like stuff like that, the 10 to 20 to $30 cards of just things that people like love to, you know, entertainment wise, it was very hot and it, I think it'll continue to be like that. Mm -hmm. I have some thoughts on that I want to talk about later. <laughs> All right, got you. Uh, really quick one here from Ryan Johnson. I think some people may know him as one of the hosts of Card Talk. Never <laughs> um, heard of him. Yeah, I know. What a bum, right? <laughs> uh, card Collector 2, he uh, said, I feel like every other person said this is their first national, and that is a very true quote that we brought up earlier, too. Um, there were so many new people, which is awesome to see. There has to be new people, obviously, to grow the hobby. Totally. All right, shall we jump into, if you keep scrolling down, we're going to jump all the way down to the Wander Franco and the Trey Young. I'm just going to let one of you two start going at this. Yeah, I think, Nate, you could speak to the numbers a little bit more, Nathan, excuse me, but something that Nathan and I spoke about on a Slab Stocks live stream in the past was this Wander card uh, when it was pulled. It's kind of a crazy story. It was pulled, I think, from a Walgreens. Is that right? The pull mm -hmm. a retail pack in a Walgreens. One of one, probably the biggest card that we know of pulled out of a retail pack recently is that fair to say i'd so, say it's pretty fair to say pretty big pull um i think the conversation we had was would this card sell for over or over or under a hundred thousand dollars at the moment i was very confident that it would not um nate was very confident that it would and as things happen i was right again um <laughs> so i think we'll get into it there was reasons why that happened but i'll, I'll let nate explain those <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Nate, Nate, let us all know what this card actually sold for. Whew. All right. So first off, funny. Very Thank funny you. of you, Lou. Uh, so this card sold for $44,400, which to me was shocking. Um, kind of shows a little bit of where the market was at and a little bit of growth amongst people in the market. I think if this was last year and the same dynamics were happening, it would still probably have gone way higher because people were crazy. That being said, um, Wander Franco, maybe this person put this card up for sale on Golden Auction well before he got injured, and it, they just took forever to get it listed. I don't know what happened there. Um, but the absolute world's worst time. The world's worst time to sell a card. So Wander in the last uh, couple months. Now, for the, year, for the year, he was hitting 260 with a 308 on base and a 396 slugging. Not good. Um, other, other underneath stats, we won't get into it point that he's getting a little unlucky, but his stats are what his stats are. But in the last couple months <clears throat> in June, he had a 402, um, uh, OPS may he had a 566 OPS July, a little bit better at 728, but still not good. And this person decided to sell now when he was in the midst of a slump and then he got injured. I don't know what you're thinking. Um, like you sell in the midst of a slump. It's one thing you sell when your player is injured. It's another thing, but you combine both those things and then sell his best tops rookie card. You're going to find until the tops Chrome super factor comes out. I mean, you're, you're asking to get hammered. And so like for me, uh, whoever bought this, actually, I think we know who bought it for $44,000 DJ ski. I feel like that's an absolute steal. Uh, when he comes back and the excitement is there and he plays like he can play because you don't become the number one prospect in baseball at his 18 unless you have absurd talent. When he comes back, I think this was this steal of the century. I agree. <clears throat> A couple of things I want to just 
put over the top of this entire conversation we're going to have for the next 40 minutes or whatever it is. Um, there's a million reasons why people sell things. There are a million factors in the market playing out right now that we're going to get into a little bit, but there's always a million reasons why someone could have sold something. I think for the purposes of our conversation, we should keep it on like just straight up the merits of selling a card at a certain moment because we don't know the individual reasons why individual cards were sold. So putting that over at top of everything, I agree with you that it couldn't have been a worse time to sell the card. Uh, he was hurt. The rays weren't great either from what I remember at that moment. Um, but still, I think it speaks to the way you the way you were saying about, you know, if this was this time last year, the market would have been different. Um, it's just tough, man. Like people can't just spend unlimited money anymore. Um, I am hearing feedback as well a little bit in the background. I'm not sure what that is. But um, I just think that in a world where cards are kind of in a weird spot, you can't just expect people to drop seventy five a hundred thousand dollars on a one of one regardless of who it is if the player isn't performing um so i do think it was an unlucky sale i would be interested like if the car went up today do you think it sells for more or less i think it sells for less now i mean this did sell within the last month remember in july i understand so. i understand i'm just saying yeah i mean if, if you, you try to sell today, it this fast, if you try to sell it this fast right after you buy it as a one of one you already took out like one person from that bidding pool yourself so you need to at least add another person who wants to spend that much money, which we don't know if that's there. So it could easily sell for under 40 grand. Um, do you think that potentially, I, I get your logic there, Aaron, and I agree. Do you think potentially that because of the $44,000 sale, maybe more eyes would be on it? Maybe people didn't realize that it was being sold on Golden. And now that they would realize it's up a second time because they're kind of keying in on it, that uh, it might go for higher? It's possible. Yeah, I think that's that's kind of what I was getting at. I think, you know, the overarching perspective of this of this sale was that it was too cheap, but I'm not so sure that's the case. I think people are confusing the world of 2020, 2020 and 2021 with 2022. Um, I think we're in a much more performance based market than we were a year ago. I think we're in uh, a much more tepid market than we were a year ago to use a different type of word than I would normally use. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I I think it's an interesting card and I would like, I'm going to be very interested to see when it does go up again. I'm not sure when Ski's going to sell it. I feel like he's not the type of guy who just kind of lists things randomly. So yeah. uh, we might not see this one for a while, but I'm interested to see it next time it comes up. Lou, I want to bring up your point quick about performance-based market now versus a year or two ago. I think over the last two years, specifically more so 2020 and 2021 also, it was kind of like buy what you can. You know, yeah, get what you can right now when you can, otherwise you won't get it. Uh, yep. I really felt like that last year also this year. I think it's a different story where we're going to mention him briefly later, but Julio Rodriguez, I mean, we're seeing record prices for his cards. A Bowman Chrome Red Auto Off 5 in August, so not in this July report, though. It sold for like 275 k for Red Auto Off 595. Now, mm -hmm. like, that is a crazy huge sale that only happened because the man is performing like crazy at a big home run derby, all that stuff. I would also make a quick point on that. You're saying that that sold in August. He's been out for like three weeks or something, right? Yeah. He so, hasn't played much recently. Yeah, and I would say that kind of also adds to the story of this wander where I, it might have just been the wrong card at the wrong time on the wrong marketplace. You know what I mean? Like there, It could have just been a perfect storm of unluckiness that led to a great spy for Ski. Yeah, I would love to touch on this Trey Young on the right very quickly. Yeah, let's do it real quick. So this card right here, this is something that, like Lou said, you don't know why people need to sell. You don't know why people buy when they do, why they sell, why they do. So just looking from a purely like what it is standpoint, this card was bought for the second time. Um, this was back in, I want to say, shoot, I thought I had, oh, back in, I thought I had it here, but 90 is bought for 200. Oh, here we are. Sorry about that. $276,000 four months prior. In July, it got relisted again through the same auction. It was bought through PWCC Premier, sold through PWCC Premier, and sold for $90,000. It's a 67% drop in four months on this Trey Young which I have to say has got one of the worst autos I've ever seen on one of one worse than your Elijah Moore. Do you think worse? I think the Eli one's tough. Well, Eli one's tough because it it's like very, it's just like so diagonally signed. This is yeah. just like a really bad auto. Yeah. You know, I think, I don't know how to, I don't know what the right way to say this is. I've, we've been talking around this subject for a while, but there's something to the reaction that people have for individual sales and cards that is just like not, a fair indication of market value like people see one sale and it becomes the narrative for a player a card cards in general the sport surrounding you know what i mean and it's just so strange like you can't say now that trey is down 70 percent. like that would be a crazy statement to make but there's people who are talking like that now 
and it's just weird. I don't I don't know the right way to to talk about that or the right way to like dissect it. I haven't really gotten there yet, but there's something about the market dynamic of one sale drives a narrative around an entire thing that I don't like. I agree with you. I want to point out last thing on this trade on one of one is that the the whole thing about one of ones and really rare items is that they don't come up for sale often. And when they do mm -hmm. come up for sale, there should be a massive bidding pool, a massive buying pool because it's your time to get it, right? Like that is your time. When you see something sold a one of one at this high caliber of card within four months of each other, it kind of just takes that feeling out of it. It's like, well, is this really that rare? You know, it's the second time in four months it's coming up for sale. It's going to come up for sale again. Now I doubt it will come up for sale for a while after selling for the lowest it's ever sold for. I think it sold for 151K um, over a year ago and that sold for 276 and now it's down to 90. But still, it's just like the whole th theory about rare cards is that they don't come up for sale. So they come up for sale very quickly. That just kind of detracts the the attraction from them, I think. Yeah, totally. And it's also the uh, something we talked about on Card Talk this week was the amount of 101s that are floating around. That's not as much of a problem for Trey, but I think there was a tweet, for, not I think, I know, there was a tweet from Eric Whiteback who was talking about Trevor Lawrence has over 1,900 one of ones. Like, just the volume of stuff that's available right now is really hard to wrap our head around. And How I think it's. Did you I think it's over 1900. If we could find a tweet, Jay, I, I'll, I'll try to find it while we're talking. Um, but it's over 1900 one of ones of, of Trevor Lawrence for this year. What the heck? That it's crazy, crazy and it's hard. And it's like at some point, you know, everyone who wants the, the high end Trevor Lawrence one of ones, that buyer pool will stop. And then I think there will become, I don't know where the prices go from there. It, I don't know. It's very interesting to think about. Lou, I have to say, when you mentioned that 1900 Trevor Lawrence one of ones, that's how I felt about new releases for a while, ever since like the kind of the COVID delays with all the Lamella Ball stuff mm -hmm. and Anthony Edwards. Since that point, it I just haven't been intrigued in the slightest to buy football or basketball cards because there's so darn many of them made and so many products and so many parallels. And so it's like five years, 10 years from now, we look up. First of all, if the players are relevant, they won't be worth anything. Secondly, mm -hmm. even if they are relevant, we don't even know which cards will be worth anything because there's so many of them that only a few will stand out. I mean, we do know some of the sets obviously are sought after, but like from a smaller capacity. I misspoke. Um, it's 1,059 one of ones. Okay, still a lot. Still the same. Yeah. So I knew a guy in Milwaukee that supposedly pulled five of the six National Treasures Collegiate one of ones out of the shop in Milwaukee. And that was the moment where I was kind of like, you know, one of one was supposed to be special. And then all of a sudden, one dude has six different one of ones from one random product, uh, specifically Collegiate National Treasures. And it's like, I mean, at what point at what point do we stop? I think it was flawless, uh, flawless Collegiate, but I agree. Uh, point difference. stands. It, yeah. It's interesting because, like, <clears throat> we go back and forth on this all the time, and I don't want to spend too much time on this. But um, you can't have the increase in popularity of cards. You can't have the increase of pricing that we've seen in the last three years while also maintaining the same level of quote like rarity or availability of cards. The question I think is how much premium do we put on like the primary one, a product one of ones, as opposed to the other one of ones. And this is no disrespect, but like a flux versus a prism has a very different value from as a one of one. Um, and I think that is where we will start to see it in, Increase premium on the primary products and the premium products like a flawless and a national treasures uh, as opposed to the others but you just can't have it both ways and i think ultimately i'd rather have more one of ones available than less but that's just me yeah i can also say from the interview of josh from later in this uh market report is that he mentioned you know like it's a little obvious but when finax really does take over the operations of the sports cards with all the new licenses for basketball and and baseball and football and stuff like they are dropping products. They are just going to be dropping products that don't matter as much. So when that flux is not being produced anymore or whatever it might be for tops, will it even matter? Probably not. Mm -hmm. All right, moving into the sports and how they moved. Um, Lou, we can hang on that graph right there. Um, this is showing six different sports. It's soccer, baseball, hockey, basketball, football, and racing, which is predominantly a formula one uh, and how they shifted this month. Soccer has got the biggest increase this month, which uh, I think is, 1.1% obviously isn't anything crazy, but remember it's a whole index which with tons of different cards in it. But it does point to World Cup is coming. People are a little bit excited about soccer right now, which is good. And the Premier League season has already returned along with La Liga and Bundesliga and Syria and all that stuff. 
Mm-hmm. The biggest thing to point out here is that football was down a lot last month. Like in June, it dropped like eight, seven to eight percent, I think. Now it's only down three percent over the last month, so it is bouncing back. Um, obvious reasons, season coming, same with basketball. But then other than that, F1 being down 7%, it took a very healthy drop here leading into the summer break. I think a lot of that has it to should. do. Yeah, I mean, it, some of the prices were ridiculous. Like if you're thinking like $30,000 for PSA 10 Aqua of Lewis Hamilton, where it's not a pop one or pop two, like that is just crazy. The more that that happens, the more they're going to be listed for sale, the more it's going to drop in price and affect this index. Also, you know, namely like Leclerc's prices were so ridiculously expensive when he won a few races that those have dropped a ton and is really affecting the index as well. Um, but over the year, it still is the highest increase. So it still shows, obviously, compared from the beginning of the year till now, it means a lot, the F1 market. But from the high highs, which were ridiculously high, uh, it is down. Yeah, and I think Nate has a question for me on the racing world, so I want to talk about that. I also want to say it definitely is down month over month. You can totally feel the difference in prices just as someone who holds a lot of F1 uh, or hold a decent amount of F1 at least. Um, but I do still think there was a lot of questions about it at the show and I'm using the national as like a, a touch point for interest. That was kind of near the top of questions that I received and people coming out to me being like, Hey, do you have X, Y, Z driver? Hey, do you have X, Y, Z card? Um, so the price is reset, which it needed to, but there's still a lot of interest, which I think is good for long-term health. I know Nate's got a question. I just want to piggyback on that and say our booth, half of the booth was formula one cards. We had a huge lot of raw cards. We got them great. He brought them to the national. So we did have a lot of wiggle room on price. I think more than, excuse me, more than other people did that brought formula one. Yep. Maybe people bought too high and weren't willing to sell lower. But for us, you know, we, we were in good prices on a lot of them to where we could give out deals. And like Lou said, the interest was so high. Like we sold over a hundred slabs of formula one cards. People were still very interested. Would we get what they sold for two months ago? No. Did we still get good prices? Yes. And were people still interested? Yes. And wanted to buy. So it was good to see. I agree. A uh, couple things here from me before I get into the F1 question, Lou. Uh, number one, for me, at least from using the national as a gauge of interest, yes, people are really interested in racing, even though it doesn't show up on the index. Also, on the index, it shows that people are interested in baseball, but our booth and a couple other people's booths that I was talking to, no baseball movement at all. Mm-hmm. Um, so it is it is kind of interesting seeing these compared to what we saw in real life because they don't really match up uh, with what we experienced at the national. And it just goes to show you that you can't you can't always take everything you see um, at at eye level or whatever. Yeah, and I also not. think I also yeah I also think that there's something to the type of person who's at a national versus the type of person who's buying on a. The, the mass of people who are buying online on a day-to-day basis. I think the people who are buying on a day-to-day basis are typically probably operating more in like a money-making flipping, I think on like the month-to-month scale. Uh, and that is reflected in those prices. Baseball isn't always the hottest thing for people who are buying and selling at a regular basis to purchase. Um, but on uh, in person, you might see more of that. Um, I want to point out too about the baseball thing. A lot of this market, either stability or increase – for this is caused by Julio Rodriguez and then Juan So's trade coming at the end of the month. Um, it did affect the baseball market a lot. It led to these increases in the indexes, but at the national, the people there, they know that Julio's prices went up X amount over the last three weeks. They know Juan So's prices are now going up because trade rumors are happening. They're not willing to buy at those increased prices, you know? Yep. I agree. Hey, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, this index, the, the baseball market change is just the cards in uh in card, card ladder. ladders yeah correct yes um, so that's a good thing to point out because obviously like 2022 bowman just came out and guys like ellie de la cruz and jackson churio and james wood they're all in there their markets have been booming and they are not encapsulated in the in this number yeah i think you're always at you're at the mercy of what's available to you in card ladder and that's something that they're constantly working on but yeah i think that's right and how much of that do you think is a function of and i I wanted to get to this a little bit with the new bowman stuff how much of that is a function of they're just new and it's the first time they're available versus you think those guys have real legs uh all three of those guys have real legs i wouldn't um for maybe not james wood but jackson churio and ellie de la cruz jackson churio is already the number two prospect on baseball america from unranked what is that about how did that happen um there are there. I've seen multiple tweets from multiple scouts and other guys that just say straight up, he's the best prospect in baseball That's right crazy. now, without a doubt. And he went from unranked to this. He was the eighth ranked Brewers prospect by Baseball America to start the year, 
He's now the second ranked prospect in all of baseball. And MLB pipeline will be close behind. He will be the number one prospect probably by the start of next year or midseason. Um, so you have him. Ellie De La Cruz has huge legs. I expect him to be a top 10 prospect as long as the strikeout problem doesn't rear its ugly head to an extent where he doesn't get to power. I expect him to be a top 10 prospect by the start of next season. Also, that's two guys in a product that are top 10 prospects. And then they have uh, James Wood should probably be like a top 50, top 40, I would imagine. And then you got guys all over that list that are going to be in the top 100 somewhere. And um, just an insane product and something that doesn't get brought up in here. And I think would probably, I mean, especially Jackson Churio, those cards started out like a, a refractor probably started out at like 20, 30 bucks. And now it's a hundred. Yeah. It was crazy. definitely a $30 card. Crazy. Uh, crazy. Sorry, uh, Aaron, we sidetracked you there. No, no worries at all. I mean, oh. you guys, you guys go at it when you want to. I was supposed to get into my F1 question though. I just <laughs> want to bring yes, you were. Quick. Uh, so Lou, here's my F1 question for you. So Aaron and I were talking the other day and, you know, 2020 and at the booth, especially people were looking for 2020 F1. They'd bring up 2021 F1 looking to sell it and flip it into 2020. Um, same thing with Dynasty. And uh, not many people were looking to, at least from what I experienced at the booth, and I wasn't always tuned into the F1 side of the booth. Uh, they weren't all looking to get 2021. They were looking to get 2020 outside of Mick Schumacher. And so my question for you is, as the years go forward, 2021 has Mick Schumacher, 2022 has Oscar Piastri, 2023 has some other random Joe well, Blow. Te technically, uh, 2023 is Oscar Piastri, 2022 is Guan Yu Joe Rookies, but yes, close. Okay. Yeah, Nate. My, my bad. But, you you know, so you get one random rookie every year, and the rest are just retreads from the previous year, except for 2020. Um, Do you think because, like, as we know, if you only have one rookie in a product, take top series one from this year, Wander. If you only have one rookie in a product, it's hard to prop up that product with just one guy because you're unlikely to of hit course. him. And so, and so as we go forward, do you think that will just make 2020 tops Chrome F1 and Dynasty that much more expensive because people just aren't going to care about these new products except for the one singular guy they're trying to chase? And then would it be wise for somebody like me to just, if I spot random dude purple out of 399 on PWCC to go buy it or eBay to go buy it yeah. and um, for cheap, even if it's a PSA seven. I want to point out before Lou says something, people will also be searching for autos. I think of any of the years because autos are pretty small quantity compared to other sports right now. Definitely. I think that's going to expand though. I think they're going to try to get more and more of those autographs because Tops is not confused about what draws people to F1, so that'll be or top slash fanatics, whoever that is what draws them. And Zipper is in the background, very talkative today, so you might hear him. But um, what I want to say is definitely 2020 will always be the the you know cream of the crop for F1. I the challenge of a sport where there's only 20 drivers in the main 20 people in the main league is that you're gonna have limited rookies year over year, and rookies is what drives a product. Um so 2020 will definitely always be the main one and where I will try to spend my energy. I there's Mick in 2020. So like, it's not like it's not available. Um, something I think they're going to need to look into and deal with is how do you attract people to a product when there's only going to be one, like it's possible there's only one person next year. It's Oscar Piastri and that's it. Like there could be no one else new this year. At least it was Yuki and Mick and you know, like there's more available this year. So um, something I, think to think about will be expansion of an f2 and f3 you know the women's league like their f1 like formula racing is trying to expand i think into a bigger brand beyond just f1 so where does the interest go when it's only you know some driver from australia who's driving for williams it's 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 tough to say but i do think 2020 will always be the cream of the crop lou get with the times driving for mclaren what did i say you said williams for piastri Oh, sorry. Yes, <laughs> McLaren. G given that McLaren pays out Ricardo's buyout, but I think that they will. Uh, I want to touch super quickly. Uh, F1 is loaded with F2 drivers right now in the products, but you're right. It kind of needs to be more formal, I think. Kind of a, like the future stars thing on it. I don't think it's really like driving a whole lot of interest on like a Mick 2020. It is driving some, but like if they were to like come out with like a formal, you know, like prospect card, 
you know, similar to the first Bowman where you do have the people in the F2 and the F3, and maybe the, the W series, like uh, Chadwick's, yep. you know, rookies or something like that, that would bring more interest to it. So it, maybe it's just a little bit like of a realignment with the products to make sure they're, you know, getting new people in each year. But there are more new people than just one rookie, I'll say, because in 2021, Piastri's Future Stars card is probably bigger than Mick's rookie and bigger than Yuki's rookie. And then there's also like Liam Lawson's first cards in there. But that's given that he gets an F1 seat eventually, which is not even close to guaranteed for a lot of these guys. So mm-hmm. that's there is a lot of challenges. You're you're completely right. Yeah, it's the challenge of a sport where there's only 20 people in the main league. Yes, de- de- definitely, definitely. So I guess then my question is, do you see do you see potential growth for something like this if there is problems like that? I mean, obviously, you bring up, you can make, you, you know, you could make a Bowman Chrome set. You could make other sets, but um, at what point, if it's just a retread of the same guys constantly over and over and over again, do people kind of lose interest? I guess lose interest in terms of what? Like they're going to stop buying their products altogether? And like a, tw- yeah, like a 2022 Lewis Hamilton card. I don't know what that's selling for. Probably not a whole lot, but the autographs, like Aaron's saying, is true. The dynasty is not going to go away. And something I think they're going to expand on, I think one of the lessons of 2020 product this year is really that like the alternate cards have a lot of legs. So there's something to like the, the George astronaut card is like one of the hottest cards in F1 right now. Right. I think, is there something about that in here or no? There's not. No, but I will point out, you're right. That's his like driver number two card. Technically. Yeah. And if you look at Hamilton's from 2021, it's like the Ferris wheel card is like one of the biggest like side card you'd say in the set. So I do agree with you. The more they can kind of like hit on those things that make more cards unique than just the portrait is going to help it out a lot. Yeah. And again, like not to say that this is going to be unlimited growth forever. I think it's a positive. It doesn't need to be. Everything sells for a lot of money forever. Um, I think that people will consistently now go back to the 2020s and your PSA eights, your PSA nines are going to start selling for a lot more money as time goes on, because number one, people are aware of the production issues. And number two, it's the first time there's ever a Lewis Hamilton card. And there's still not that much of it. Even the base card compared to everything else right now, the volume, like the, the amount of it available is definitely lower than every other sport. First tops Lewis Hamilton card. Tops Chrome. Yes, 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 yes. I'm just yeah. saying because he had some back in 05 and 06. But Sorry. Yeah, I'm talking about the 2020 tops Chrome. Yes, yes, yes. I agree with you. I just want to make sure people know what you meant. Um, all right. Good question, Nate. Let's move down and let's skip over some of this stuff. If you want to, obviously, you can read about the market trends per sport like we talked about. 137pm.com. 137pm.com. It's a good thing to understand. Um, and then we've got these little this little chart here about vintage versus modern versus ultra modern, which, as you can tell, pre-war and vintage has had a green monthly change on the card ladder indexes for those. They're very high year to date, 5% or more on each, which is big for vintage, especially in a down market. You're talking small gains per year. Uh, steady gains per year uh, but there's a reason for that and we can talk about that as you kind of go and hover above the next graph and um, Lou would like for you to kick off just the overall vintage and we'll get into these two cards yeah I think I'll let you speak to the individual numbers for sure that's not my thing um, but just a, a general perspective I have here is that uh, it seems to me that vintage has become the new thing for people to buy at least over the last month um, And I think in a world where everyone thought they could just print money with modern forever, that party kind of ended and people moved into something like a vintage because as collect OG collectors have told us for years now, and people who have been around forever have told us vintage is the one that always wins over time. But the problem is when everyone runs the vintage, there's definitely going to be a reset. Now I'm looking forward to seeing this chart next month. Um, But things like I appeal things like, uh, player matter even more as opposed to rookie card which is how it goes in the modern market so i will let aaron speak to the numbers here even you know uh a lower grade uh jackie robinson versus a 1963 maze like all this is very interesting to me vintage market is like the most interesting and has the biggest knowledge gap i think which is why i'm drawn to it but i'm interested to hear aaron yeah i want to uh preface this with i'm no vintage expert i look at the market i own like two vintage you told cards me you were <laughs> no, no, I've not said that. A 54 Hank Aaron rookie and a 56 Jackie. I just love those cards. But I want to talk about what Lou said. You know, once you get all this attention, especially like kind of social media buzz around a specific segment, you can see specifically on these indexes that it's outpaced modern, ultra modern by a ton recently. And when that happens, which makes no sense. It 
it doesn't in a in a small aspect of like you know I'd, I'd say long term like it would make more sense but like in a very like short amount of time frame it doesn't make sense because this has been around for years and years and years and years and years and years, and years, and years to where like when something like that happens within one month a uh, uh, over one percent gain on the entire indexes for that it's kind of a cause for a concern in general because we got a precursor of this with the basketball rookies of like Dr. J and Oscar Kareem. Robertson. Yeah. Oscar Robertson, Kareem. And then uh, also like the triple uh, rookie with like, you know, the Larry Bird and magic and then Dr. J, which isn't a rookie, but still those things like shot up a ton. Remember during the LeBron and the Kobe craze, mm-hmm. when everyone was going to buy LeBron and Kobe, everyone also went to buy these basketball rookies. Now they dropped a ton after that. And now we're kind of seeing this with baseball to where some of these vintage cards are going up a lot in price. Subsequently, I definitely expect to be drops in the next three to six months because you just can't sustain stuff, especially when there's no necessarily performance based metrics right now. If Julio keeps killing it the rest of the year and into next year, you might see that sustain. But it's like if it's just a rush to buy these things because people think that this is the place to be, it eventually runs out, in my opinion. I'm um, not to say vintage are not a great buy long term. If I were giving a recommendation, I'd say just sit back and watch for a second. And then jump in later. If you are going to purchase vintage cards, again, this is just my perspective. Things can change. There's reasons for everything. If you're going to buy a PSA one Jackie Robinson, you probably shouldn't be looking to flip that inside of 12 months. Yes. It's just there isn't there isn't much upside for you other than the short term little window where things are running like crazy. The reason you buy a card like this is because in 15 years, it's going to be worth more than you paid for it, period. I agree with that. And funny enough is that we actually did grab a couple pre-1980 cards last Sunday night when we're doing our Flip Quest episode. One of them was a Robin Yacht rookie. Just one a Robin Yacht rookie. We're huge Brewers fans. The other one was like a $30 uh, uh, Sir or Bobby Charlton um, soccer card from like 1959. Just super cheap and cool. And then the other one was a Noel Ryan that was one of my first cards I had from my grandma back in the day. And it's very like cool things to me to where like not necessarily for a sell a flip just for that long-term thing that Lou pointed out. And in terms of the PSA ones really quick here, this is one of the most interesting things I think in this entire report. You've got two PSA ones in the center of this graphic. A 53 maze looks really good. It got the superior, the superior eye appeal from PWCC, which means it's in like the top 5% that they've seen. And then you've got the Jackie Robinson on the right, which also looks pretty good for a one. It's definitely got like pinholes in it. It's got a crease. But if you look to the right of that, the Jackie Robinson that sold for $732 recently, super, super damaged. Super damaged. Like that was sold in July for 732. And then like How a couple of have the same grade. What do you say? Are those both PSA ones? So they're both PSA ones, but that's the point to where when you're looking at vintage, it's very hard to just say like, oh, this Jackie Robinson PSA one increased 241% in two mm-hmm. weeks. It's like, no, this Jackie Robinson is light years better than the other Jackie Robinson PSA one. So it just sold for more because of that. Because that more recently selling one, the, the better condition sold for 2500 But that's about the going rate for a PSA 1. Unless you have one that looks like it got dragged through the mud like Nate when he was a kid probably. Well, do, you th- do you think they should have a different grading scale for vintage because of this issue right here? To me, there should be a point to where a card is so bad that it gets inauthentic. That's what I think. To where there's a standard for the worst PSA 1 you can have, which is not ripped in half. It is a card like this Jackie right here. And then after that, I think it should just get authentic. Like, I don't think that that one on the far right qualifies for a, a poor one, you know? Yeah. And it's like, you know, when it's being graded, what are the standards then? I think that's part of the thing. And something I think that um, collectors, the company as a whole would benefit from is some sort of level of transparency of like, Hey, this is what qualifies as a PSA one. This is an example of a card that would be marked as authentic. And it's okay for the card to be marked as authentic. It's just not worthy of a one. Yeah, not every exactly. card you put in this lab is at least a one. That's just not how it goes. And, and I actually, funny enough, I asked SGC one time. I had a prism base card that has super bank corner. It, uh, my friend had the card show with me at VCon. Shout out, Lou. Uh, Shout actually out ripped the card in half because it's just like a, a random prism base of a Chicago Bulls vet, the Thomas Sedaransky or whatever his name is. And I asked SGC, I was like, hey, if I graded, the front half of this card would it get a one and they said no it'd get an authentic so like, i think that there is something to be said for maybe what sgc is doing like if they were to get a card that's so unbelievably damaged and what it, it just can't get a one just because it's authentic you know that actually has to be like worthy of a one but i also don't know for sure you know i think that maybe every company kind of does it different which is also grading in general there's no standard scale so that is where like so much of this just comes into eye appeal which yes. matters so much with vintage yes and that sorry nate i'm gonna let you go in a second the thing is there's a level on top of the grading 
with a PWCC where they have their own I appeal scale, which is just another grading scale, uh, yeah. which adds an added layer of knowledge to the card, which is again, why I say, I think vintage is always so interesting um, and so fun to follow. Definitely. So if you want there to be a PSA authentic or an SGC authentic for these, um, that I don't want anything <laughs> that don't qualify. Okay. That you don't want, but brought up um, <clears throat> if, if you want it to, if you don't want it to be, uh, I'm all mixed up now. Uh, if there is to be a authentic scale for things yes. that aren't one, then you'd have to get rid of people being a allowed to grade something authentic without it getting a grade, right? I, no. I don't think so because, sorry, Lou, I'll go first. Because once it's authentic, I think it forces everyone to look at the card and buy based off the card. I agree. I think you can still do authentic. It, there's a whole other conversation to be had with the authentic thing where it's like, oh, if this card's too low to get the number I want, I'm just going to throw authentic on it and it's better. And then you do like the auto 10 and there's that whole game. That whole thing is stupid. We could talk about that at a later date. But I don't think you have to get rid of one to serve the other. You can do both. And I think you end up helping helping cards like this as opposed to hurting them. The whole reason why I bring this up is because when we look at the specific vintage index, and this Jackie shows a 241% gain that factors into that 1.1% monthly change in like the vintage market uh, index. You got to just know that like some of these indexes, like while it's good to look at this from a general sense, because I guarantee you that with vintage showing green on this chart, more people are buying vintage right now. It's obvious more people are talking about it, but there's also kind of like some like, Hey, make sure you understand that either could be overstated or understated because of these different reasons. There's research that needs to be done on every single purchase you do. Every single card needs to be judged individually in a vacuum of itself, as opposed to thinking about the thing at large and saying, oh, cards from 1945 and below are, are hot right now. I'm just going to start scooping stuff up. That's not how you do it with vintage. No, definitely not. Next. Perfect. Next. We'll scroll down and we'll just jump right into this. Uh, Tatum, Luca, and Giannis. This is related to the chart we just skipped over, which is about the different price levels, you know, mid, mid end, low end, high end. But for these specific cards right here, these are all high end basketball cards and they're good basketball cards. Like you think about like, what's a good card An NTRPA of Jason Tatum's a good card. A prism red, super short print of Giannis is a good card. Um, on card, Luca auto good card. All of them dropping 25% or more just in July. This is one month changes on these things. This is not looking back to year to date, not looking back a year ago. The whole point here is that, like, you see your star player, like ours is Giannis, playing awesome in the playoffs. Of course, it didn't pay out to the championship this year. Just pump the brakes and wait till the offseason. A lot of time you'll see these 25% drops in specific cards because there's just not that talk. There's not that buzz around said player. All three of these are going to be the faces of the NBA going forward. But all three of them, if you bought it during the playoffs, you're losing a ton of money on. Yeah, and I think this also speaks to like the availability of these cards, right? Like they've this car, these cards have sold not this these exact copies, but some version of these cards have sold hundreds of times in the last two years, right? Like it, there's just been so much liquidity, and I think it speaks to buyer pools getting smaller, um, the the speed at which these cards are being flipped. I think you just got to make some decisions when you're buying cards like this, when you're buying it as a big factor, like you're saying, buying these cards in the playoffs and then flipping them a few months later is probably not the best move. Um, but it's also just like patience with ownership and all that stuff is very interesting. And you know, 25% loss is no joke. Let me, sorry, Nate, really quick about selling dynamics with something like this. So that Tatum, first off, I want to point out that this is a one color patch auto. The other one that sold for like two times as much was a two color, but like a $20,000 difference is not because of one little color on a patch. Yeah. I do want to say very quickly that when something like this Tatum sells for an all time high of like forty five, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, there's definitely gonna be someone who comes out of the woods trying to sell their card, even if it's number out 15 to capitalize on that, like all time high peak sale. I agree. Inevitably, if the narrative changes for a player or more buyers are taken out of the pool because they just aren't as, you know, like, oh, Tatum's going to win the finals. I need to get it right now. Next thing you know, you lose 50% of the bidders on that card. There you go. That's why it sells for lower. But the person who sold this thing for 23000 probably still made like ten grand on this card. And they probably yep. aren't mad about it. Yep. That's right. And again, why necessarily when something sells doesn't necessarily mean how much that person made. They didn't necessarily lose money. Nathan, go ahead. Um, I think it should be mentioned, at least uh, from from where I'm sitting. Um, did you guys, both of you, did you ever buy basketball cards back in the day? 
like, back, in the, back day, in the day, like five years ago or two years ago? Uh, f- five to whatever. Yes, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, at some point, okay. yeah. Do you, have you bought a basketball card within the last year? Nope. Nope. I think may, I, what may, you're about to say one. is right. Yeah, I think I bought one Anthony Edwards patch order from Noir because I love this set. I think he's a beast. No. Yeah, and it's just one of those things where, like, if your guys is – I mean, I, I never bought basketball cards. I, I buy my Kansas Jayhawks. I, I bought a Adoka Azubuki at the show, a select courtside green out of five. Dude walked up, 60 bucks, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, But that's not for resale. That's just for me to have, right? Other than Darius Baisley. And, and, well, yeah, okay. So I did buy one within the last, like, year. Um, And I made money on it, so shout out. But, <laughs> but that being said, you know – I think if a lot of people are like you, where you used to dabble in basketball and then you just found things that were more interesting to you, um, whether it be F1 or it be soccer or, you know, Stranger Things or Star Wars or anything like that, well, you only have a finite amount of money that you can spend. Mm -hmm. And that money that you would have spent on, and maybe you don't have as much money as somebody else that would spend, but, you know, it still adds up for everyone that does it. That money that you would have spent on basketball is now completely out of basketball, 100 yep. percent. And I feel like that's what we're looking at here. Yeah, I think the expansion of the hobby in general has led to people spending their money in other places. You're right. And I also think it's just fatigue. I think people are sick of basketball cards. They're sick of talking about Luca. They're sick of talking about Giannis. Tatum's a little different, but I just think in general, people are a little bit over it and they're expanding into other stuff. And in a world where Zero Cool is focusing on pop culture, there's gonna that's not stopping. There's gonna be more stranger things and stuff like that. And you know, shout out Kim Kardashian going through a tough breakup right now. Like Kim's gonna have a set, the Kardashians are gonna have a set coming soon. Like that stuff's gonna happen. And there's not gonna be as much money to to dump into a basketball. <laughs> Uh, I want to validate both of your points on it, that it needs it, but I agree with both of you from like the um, people look at other things because with being really heavily involved in soccer for the last like three years, I would talk to a ton of soccer fans. People are like, love the Premier League, love the La Liga, the national teams, all this stuff. And I remember listening to a lot of people talking to me and they'd say, oh, well, basketball was hot, so I had to go and learn the market because I felt like that I had to be in that market to try to make money. And then maybe they take a little bit of money and go spend it on soccer. But then as other things start to rise, you know, as soccer went through its rise over the last three years, they kind of like take note, like, oh, my gosh, people actually do care about it. Well, in general, a lot of people cared about it. They just didn't think that other people were buying it. So it's kind of like, oh, I'm just going to sit this out because no one else is going to buy it. Mm -hmm. So they all went to basketball. As other stuff started to get validated, soccer and like Nate pointed out, the entertainment series and, you know, even F1 now, all that money has really, really, really spread out far. The hobby is still huge. We just said that the most people since the 90s attended a national. But basketball is down like 25% overall in the past year. That's why. Yeah, there's something about I, – I, and again, I think there's just a larger thing happening in sports. Like, I think people are just not as into the big four as they used to be. Is that true? Do you feel that as well? Like, I feel it myself. I can't even – watch basketball like it's just so boring and just so doesn't do it for me because there's so much drama going on and that's the other part a lot of sports has now become about stuff happening off the court off the field off the ice whatever like all that stuff i think is just leading to a lot of fatigue around these things and remember people are doing more things too right now sure you know, you know covid's really you know other than the national for people it's really you know kind of like ran its course for a lot of people but yeah it, it also probably has to deal with like who you're a fan of. I mean, if you're a fan of the New York Knicks, you might be sick of watching the Knicks and yeah, maybe. having to hear about the Knicks constantly. If you're a fan of the Milwaukee Bucks and you are one Chris Middleton away from probably w- winning a championship or at least making an appearance in the championship, um, you know, you're a little bit more interested in basketball still, and I'm still pumped up about the upcoming Bucks season. Yeah, but it doesn't always relate to the cards. Doesn't always drive into the cards. All right, let's get to the yeah. final thing here. I know we've been on for like an almost De- an hour already. So. Definitely. So um, we'll just skip all these winners. I'll shout them out quick, and then we'll talk about one loser. Uh, Aaron Judge, don't really have to say much. Amazing month in July. Going to win the MVP of baseball. Seriously, double-digit home runs. All of his cards have been rising the last month, and then the big sale was that BGS 10, uh, Aaron Judge, the gold refractor auto for 27000 Let me pause you for one second. Do you think it would be a good time? Like once they lose in the first round – do you think that'll be a good time to sell, or do you think you end up waiting until next season? Oh, no, you should sell right now if you're ready to make money. Well, they'll, they'll probably play the Twins, so they're going to win the first round and then move on. 
Okay, that's a fair point. Yeah, so if you're expecting at least you're expecting one round and out for the Yankees, maybe you hold on for a little bit. You longer. don't want to wait too long. If you're looking to make money in the next six months, you probably should be selling up. Okay, I know fair enough. Talking from an Astro perspective, but I'm just saying. Uh, just AD, I think, I think I think Anthony Davis's market dropped so much that people are kind of starting to look back at it with a healthy season maybe on the way. I say maybe because like when was the last time he was fully healthy? And then Kyler Murray got a new extension, and uh, you see that big sale right there, the gold vinyl one of one PSA ten. From Optic Contenders sold for twenty five thousand dollars. Although that is a lot of money, kind of compared to like the Herbert and the Burrows of the world, that is also probably like twenty five percent or less than what those other guys would sell for. So clearly, you can tell that people aren't that big on Kyler's market. Otherwise, mm-hmm. I would have for sure sold over fifty k. The one loser we should talk about. You've got Leclerc, whose Ferrari has bottled everything so far recently. But Mike Trout, and I want Nate to kind of give a give his little thoughts on Mike Trout and the overall market of buying the safe guy because it's worth talking. about. Yeah, so for years, if you were in the card market and people told you to buy the goats or buy the safe guy, I would argue that Mike Trout was probably third or fourth. You would have like Michael Jordan, LeBron James, Tom Brady, and then it would be hard to argue for anybody else than Mike Trout. I'm sure you could make some arguments, but he's there, right there, as the one of the safest investments you could possibly have. And um, if we've, and obviously he's a Hall of Famer. If he retired today, absolute Hall of Famer, no doubt about it. But as we learned with Andrew Luck, there are no safe investments, turns out. And now we find out that Mike Trout has a chronic back issue. He might never play a full season ever again, amongst other issues he has to deal with. Um, I, yeah, you know, he had a leg injuries last year, right? And so, like for me, it's crazy how Mike Trout probably went from as safe as you can possibly get. No doubt about it. And he is, no doubt about it, a Hall of Famer. But it was not just making the Hall of Fame that was baked into Mike Trout's prices. It was being over 100 wins above replacement, trying to close in on Barry Bonds' record for wins above replacement, Babe Ruth, and trying to become like a top five player all time. A Babe Ruth, a... Willie Mays, uh, you know, one of those type guys. And with these injuries that he's dealt the last couple of years with COVID and now with this chronic back issue that is not going to go away and he's already, he just turned 31 like three days ago. um, You went from being ultra safe to being sort of like, oh, I don't really want a Mike Trout card right now. Yeah, I agree with you. And I also think how much of this was people just assuming that eventually the angels would be good and he would start competing at some point. Like the stats are great. He's really great. Everyone's always known that they've just been bad for most of his career. And as they've continued to add more and more people to the team, I mean, they have Otani, they have Rendon, they have trout and they just don't win. Uh, who else did they just got like uh Syndergaard, right? Like, they, like they've never stopped adding talent, right? They just haven't come through. I think the combination of kind of the realization of, oh, this is kind of who he is and what his career is going to be, plus this new back injury is leading to people reevaluating some things. Definitely. I agree. I'll just retweet what you guys said. <laughs> All right, Lou, give me a scroll. Now will round off talking about the uh, different player trends and everything. If you go to the bottom report, there's just uh, one last takeaway, which is about the Fanatics effect going forward. Uh, feel free to watch the video, look at the different timestamps and what you want to you know learn about. I asked Josh dozens of different questions and he gave really good answers. So I really highly recommend listening if you can. Um, And then if you just scroll down, you also get to see different card shows you might want to attend in August or different product releases. If you want to find some new cards, feel free to read about those on 137pm.com. And for the final take, I do want to uh, just have a brief discussion before we wrap this up about what it means when you see, we don't have to get into much financial talk, but like, when you see different stock indexes and uh, cryptocurrencies in July, like going green and getting people returns on stuff that they may have lost in the past, uh, it kind of makes me feel like that the card market with what we, Lou and I talked about last episode, uh, how it's less liquid. You don't see the gains as fast, but you also don't see the drops as fast because you got to list the card. You got to sell the card. You got to ship the card. You got to get the card in. Then you got to resell it again. Like everything is just a little bit slower to where I think two months from now, three months from now, especially when those football seasons have started, the Premier League is going, the basketball season is coming back, NHL is coming back. I think when we look up two months from now, we do like the October report or something like that, we're going to see quite a bit of green on those monthly sport charts compared to right now where there's only two green uh, out of like the six we're looking at. It could be like four maybe by then. 
yeah, I think it'll be interesting. Um, we're in a weird time in the world right now. We are things are not changing from where they are currently in the world at large. So I'll be interested to see what happens with the card. I think hopefully I think this time is teaching people about patience, the value of patience in this thing and the value of like sticking to what, you know, I think there's been a lot of people who've been just running around chasing bags for the last two years. who are going to have to stop doing that and start making decisions about like, what do they actually know? What do they feel comfortable buying and selling? What do you feel comfortable holding for six to 12 months? Because the time of buying something and selling it in three weeks for 20% is over for now at least so it's interesting 200 percent. yeah what you know you know what i mean right i don't want to overdo it i hope i always catch myself overdoing those things like when i said 1900 instead of 1100 before but uh you know what i mean and i think it's a good thing for the market right now what's happening and not good in that people are losing money that's tough but there's a lot of lessons that are people that people are learning and i think it's a good thing i think it'll make people stick around if they want to stick around that's the most important part and i have seen a lot of people stick around which is really good to see i agree Nathan, Nate, any last I'm thoughts on that? Uh, what Aaron said earlier, I'm going to retweet you guys. <laughs> there we go. All right, Lou, you ready to wrap it up? Yeah, let's wrap it up. Um, again, thank you, everyone, for listening. Please check out 137pm.com for the market report. We will be tweeting it out. We'll be putting it on social. We'll be putting it everywhere. Um, thank you to Aaron and his team for putting it together. Thank you to Nathan for joining us. Thank you to Jay for the flu game behind the scenes. Um, and we will see you in August. Peace. Appreciate it, everyone. See you guys.